My name is Rochelle B and I'm here with Martin J, as weird as that is for me. Um, we are here reuniting the original Soka Vision team for a very special 30 years and 50 years. Um, so yeah, welcome back, Soka Vision. <laughs> Why is it weird? Because I don't call you Martin J, so okay. saying it is weird Well, just for me. call me what you normally call me. Let's start. Um, first things first, mm -hmm. your career. A lot of people think that you started out in Soka, but you didn't. Mm -hmm. So can you give us a little background to who you were before Martin J? Okay, so I think the first part of my DJ journey started shortly after my dad died in 1984. Um, I bonded very, very closely with my cousin Ian mm -hmm. uh, from Satisfaction Sound. Obviously at that time there was no Satisfaction Sound. We started buying records together. We, most of my teenage years, I spent raving with him. I spent doing most stuff with him. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I got to 18, we had created quite a formidable record collection, a little sound system. We were DJing at house parties and so on and so forth. A lot of people encouraged me to get on the radio because of my voice. Um, and so I got on a pirate radio station at that time called Pioneer. That was my first ever radio station. Um, and I went under the name of Crazy MD. Um, shortly after that, I moved on to a radio station called The Big Apple. Um, and these th th time frames, we're talking only like a like couple months at a time. So I was with Pioneer for a few weeks and then I moved to Big Apple. And then the big move for me was to a radio station called WLR which was run by Mikey Coos, who had originally run Time FM. Um, he then went on to run Unique FM. Uh, so he's a well-known man in the radio world. Um, and I was playing Lovers Rock and Rare Groove and Soul Music. That was my forte. Um, that's what I enjoyed playing. Um, it was it was it was an enjoyable time for me. It was an enjoyable time for me. But that's how I started off. Do you want to know how I moved on to soca <laughs> music? Uh, let's touch on the voice first, because you okay. mentioned you yeah. went onto radio because of your voice. Yeah. I feel like a lot of DJs now either like to play music or like to speak. So now in 2020, you more have a mic man and then a DJ, whereas you could do both. How did you find your voice? I stumbled across it. I think when we were younger, you're talking about the mid 80s, you know, um, you either rapped like a hip hop artist, or it wasn't even called hip hop at that time, you were a rapper, um, mm. or you toasted like a Jamaican artist. Toasted? Yeah, so toasting was chanting on a microphone. Fun. Yeah? Um, <laughs> And that's what it was called. It was called Toasting. Um, so the likes of Tipper Irie, Daddy Colonel from the Saxon Sound System. A lot of the, a lot of the MCs at that time were, were the people... When you had a sound system, you had a designated role. Mm -hmm. So you'd have an operator, who was the person that controlled all the knobs. Mm -hmm. And then you had a selector, who literally just flipped through the records and said, right, you play that. Um, and then you had an MC. Mm -hmm. Um... I wasn't doing that obviously, I was like playing music and picking up this microphone and talking with a particular voice and um, everyone used to say, why, when not sound like Tony Blackburn up on the radio and, and that kind of talk started to emerge a lot. Um, Your voice is really, really clear, you should try radio. Um, and so that's where I kind of started to think, all right, my voice is going to be a asset for me and it was so then let's go back and how did you get onto playing soca when i first started on the radio in um i was like playing one or two soca tunes um and that, so when i went over to wlr mikey coos said to me one day called me up and said crazy you have to do smoke at your show, and I'm going I said, yeah, all right, cool. Two hours of soca music. Wow. Called Ian. I said, Ian, I've got to do a soca show on WLR. I'm going to have to 
get all Auntie Teresa's records, that's his mum, get all Auntie T's records together and put together mm -hmm. a two hour show. And so I did it. Um, that was the beginning. Smokey's brother heard, heard the show and said to Smokey, I hate repeating this story, but um, even when I repeated it on uh, the other day, Smokey's corrected me, so I'm going to say it the way he would want me to say it. Um, Smokey's brother Terence said to him, there's a young guy on the radio who's done your show and he sounds better than you. He doesn't know what he's playing, but he sounds better than you. And Smokey invited me to his record shop, um, where his brother's record shop, um, TJ Records, and I went down there, Clarence Road in Hackney. Um, that was a long trip for me, because I lived in West London at the time, and um, I walked out of there with a case of records, and that was my starting point as a soca DJ. And um, shortly after doing that show, Mikey Coos again said, He's called Sonny Roberts from Orbiton Records and he's going to sponsor my show. So I'll go down and see him. So I went to Orbiton Records, which at the time was on Craven Park Road in Halsden. Um, and again, I came out of there with another box of records. Within the space of about a month, I had gone from having like maybe 15 to 20 soca records to like two boxes worth of soca music. And these were presents, right? These were presents, um, and you know those those people invested in my future. So I I felt obliged to make sure that I put it to good use. So I started. I can't even remember if I gave the Nago program a show, but I was on every weekday evening for one hour. Um, it might have been called the Soka Express or something like that, um, but it was from seven p.m. to eight p.m. every evening on WLR, which was West London Radio. Looking back, if you wasn't doing what you're doing now, if you never went on radio, wasn't doing presenting, what do you think you would have been doing now? I was a legal clerk at the time that I got onto radio. Um, and admittedly, Radio started to take all my focus away mm -hmm. from anything else. So, the answer to your question, I, I may still be in the legal field um, if I wasn't doing DJ. Hard to think about what I would do <laughs> if I hadn't done that because I've been in it for 30 years now. But um, I would probably be in the legal field. Can you tell us something that you think nobody knows about you. Woo. Well <laughs> something that nobody knows. And if not nobody then maybe only a handful may know. I think what surprised a lot of people is that I'm quite shy. Okay. And so if you, if I'm in my environment, mm -hmm. I'm fine, I'm bold and I'm cool. So a studio, for instance, with a microphone, I'm at home. On stage, with a microphone, regardless of how many people there, I'm at home. Put me in another environment, where there's a lot of people and you'll find that I'll tend to be very quiet and stay to the back. Mm. Fun. Yeah, news to me. Yeah, there you I'll go. Never see you as shy. Job done. Okay, let's get a little bit personal. In the past, mm -hmm. you've been very ill. Mm -hmm. So ill you've ended up in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Since having those experiences, has it changed anything within you? Do you think differently? Hmm. Okay. Um, 2004, mm -hmm. I collapsed and I had an emergency hernia operation. Um, if you to ask me, did I change after that? I think the answer would be no. 2015, mm -hmm. I had a pulmonary embolism and. Um, 
Can you tell us what that means? Yeah. <laughs> so the pulmonary embolism is it's something to do with your heart. It, it, without sounding over dramatic, it's very much like a mini heart attack. Yeah, right. and I had a clot on my lungs, um, which I, I believe was created because I gave up smoking the month before, and I believe that all the gunk and wrong stuff just started to clog up together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 100% sure because I'm, I'm not a medical expert or anything like that, but. I gave up smoking on the 26th of Feb, and by the 31st of March, as you know, I was being admitted to hospital. When I went into hospital, I walked in there, it wasn't like I collapsed or anything. Mm -hmm. um, I had just said to your mum, when we get up in the morning, take me to the hospital. And we went in on a Sunday afternoon, and there was me thinking I'm going to be out in time to do my show at 6 o'clock. Uh, and I spent the next week in there. Um, that was a wake-up call for me. Um, I changed my diet because I, you know, they diagnosed me as being diabetic. They diagnosed me as being having high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and obviously a big guy like me that's always drinking and that kind of stuff. I half knew what was going on, you know. Um, then in two thousand and eighteen. I got admitted into hospital again, but this time that was the one that hurt. It hurt because I had just spent so long training really, really hard. I lost over three stone and then I ended up in hospital and I was like, what? <laughs> you know, um, but have I learned from it? Yeah, um, 2015 changed the way I look at things in many, many ways. And... Um, if you imagine that, I went into hospital March 2015. By May 2015, I knew that there was going to be an addition to our family. And she arrived in December. Mm -hmm. The new addition changed my life a lot. Let's leave it at that, because um, I will get emotional about it. The new edition changed my life a lot. Looking back, you're about to be the big 5-0. Yep. Is there anything you would have done differently? No. <laughs> the reason being, um, I don't think... I think I've learned from all the mistakes I've made in my life. And if I didn't... If I didn't make those mistakes, mm -hmm. then I'm not sure that I would have learned from them um, I very much believe that the last five years of my life mm -hmm. have been some of the most rewarding um, and that for me is Seeing where, you know, for a lot of people, you know, you're on choice, you're meeting all these celebrities, you're living the life. That was a high, and it was a high. It was a really enjoyable life. I was earning good money. Um, I didn't, I wasn't as wise as I should have been with my money. Mm -hmm. But I can sit here in 2020 and say that I've taken a better route mm -hmm. at doing a lot of the stuff that I was doing before and I don't think I'd be able to do that had I not gone through what I went through. So the answer to your question is no. Fine. As you just mentioned, you've done so much. Where do you see yourself or what is to come for Martin J? I recently did a talk uh, online for a school. Um, so currently I work with a lot of adults, with not even adults, I work with a lot of people that have either got autism or they've got a learning disability. Mm -hmm. um, and I teach media programs to them, like how to do a podcast, yeah. how to be a DJ, photography, basic videography, that kind of thing. And um, I went online and I did this talk and I said it's not about paving the way because I didn't pave the way, you know. A lot of people, maybe your age, 
we say, yeah, Martin Day's a legend, we 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 and he paved the way for people like us. But remember, people have done, been there long before me doing the same thing. But it's about passing on that baton, you know? Um, if you think about when Smokey gave me that first box of records, mm. I need to give that back to somebody, you know? And so that's where I envisage myself in the next 10 to 15 years, just giving back, passing on that baton, um, taking the experience that I've learned. If I get called in to do a project, I'm going to pull a couple of people along with me, you know? Um, so, yeah, that's where I see myself. Everyone is going through quite a rough time now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, COVID-19 is affecting everybody mm -hmm. worldwide. Mm -hmm. What can you say you've learned from going through this pandemic? A couple of my close friends had have had this conversation with me. And 2020, for me, has been a really positive year. So it's kind of it's it's weird, you know. I was, we were sitting down in the front room together at home when someone crashed into our cars, both of them, you know. Um, but what transpired in the next seven days? I ended up driving a car that I love. I've given it a name, you know. I call my car Freddy. It's and I just sit in the car when I'm driving it, and I'm so proud of it. And I don't think that I felt I was in a position to have a car like that at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a firm believer of turning negatives into positives. And I'm a firm believer of having a positive outlook on life. Um, when I relaunched my website, DJ DJMartinJ.com, mm -hmm. the slogan there is sunrise after each cloud, which is a line that comes from Devon Matthew and Ella Andal's song, The Journey. Remember the days of toting water Anytime that you have to bid Oh, when people pass and they see you Oh, my Lord used to feel that shame Wondering if this lasts forever Wondering when you will feel proud If there's one thing that he didn't tell me There is sunrise after each cloud I say, even though Devin's no longer with us, but it's ironic that I never met him, mm -hmm. but we talked a lot. You know, he's done a dub plate for me, <laughs> all sorts, and I've never met him face to face. Um, but there is sunrise after each cloud, that's what I believe. And so, whilst we're going through this pandemic, and Yes, it can drag people down into a dark place because uh, there have been days when I've, I've felt that. Um, there are people that are going to be watching this that have lost their jobs or they're about to lose their jobs and the future's uncertain. Even for me, there's, uh, there's no certainty as to what I'll be doing in a year's time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the way to switch it around is to to have a positive outlook on life, you know, and believe that something will happen, um, and then try and make it happen. How I want to finish up is just asking, how do you want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? I think just as a guy that entertained us, you know, um, with my radio show, The Caribbean Affair, it's like my baby. Um, and when I say my baby, it's, it's ironic that I'm in a room where my son's filming and you're interviewing me. Um, and you two are the two most important things. Caribbean Affair for me is a, is, a, is a the radio program that I started on Choice in 1990 is a program that every week I thought about what I was doing, how I was doing it and the feedback that I got from the public is what kept me going um, and 
to this day when I do radio shows on Back in Our Radio, you know, even if I do the Friday morning show or the Sunday show, it's the feedback from the public. So the way that I want to be remembered is the person that made me smile, made me feel positive. Being in the industry that you're in, mm -hmm. now being where you are, do you look at life and people differently or how do you look at life and people now? Um, I think you go through certain stages of your life um, and so the, 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 the first answer is yeah I do look at things differently um, but I'm not sure why I look at them differently I'm not sure whether it's because I'm approaching 50 or I am 50 um, is it because I've now got a grandchild that you know I've got to think about her few, I kind of leapfrog you and Dwayne and start thinking about her and other grandchildren um, you know and how we provide for them how do we make their world better um, so I will tell younger people that the older you get the smaller your circle is yeah your network of friends will become much smaller um, so whilst you're in your young years enjoy it but just don't hinge all your expectations on people around you um, because there's there's only going to be a select few that are going to stay for a really 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 long ride with you and if you're lucky to have that um, appreciate it you know appreciate it that that's one thing I've definitely learned and it's not to say that you know, I look back at my 40th birthday party where, you know, there was over 400 people there. Um, and it was invitation. It weren't like, I wasn't selling tickets or anything like that. Um, and some of the people in there that I would have classed as my closest friends are no longer part of my network, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe in experiences, you know, and I, I wouldn't say, oh, I wish I never had that friendship. Um, it's just things will change. So um, I do look at things differently, but I think I'm a lot calmer now. I'm a lot calmer. I'm very happy and comfortable with the space that I'm in. Good. Well, thank you very much. We made it. We did. <laughs> just. We did. <laughs> I couldn't do this on live, I can tell you that. I couldn't do it live. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been um, a good conversation. Happy 50th. Thank you very much. Let's have a drink. Let's do it.